Hey all, welcome back to the Real Life Pharmacology Podcast. I am your host, pharmacist Eric Christensen, and I thank you so much for listening today. Uh, As always, if you haven't signed up yet, go check out reallifepharmacology.com. We've got a top 200 study guide. It's the 31-page PDF, a lot of material there, and great resource uh, if you're just looking up to, to brush up you know, on some of the most important clinical pearls of those top 200 drugs, or if you're taking, you know, board exams, finals exams for pharmacology, uh, great resource uh, just to, to brush up on things. So absolutely free, no cost to you, uh, simply for following the blog. And we provide updates when we've got uh, new podcasts available, new content available, and, and things of that nature. So again, Real Life Pharmacology, go check that out. If you want to track me down, um, comments, suggestions, uh, things like that, definitely um, reach out to me, mededucation101 at gmail.com, or I'm probably most active on uh, LinkedIn. So Eric Christensen, uh, PharmD, BCGP, BCPS. All right, so let's get into what you guys came here today for, uh, and that'd be escitalopram is the drug. And brand name of this medication is Lexapro. Um, I have covered uh, SSRIs in general, but wanted to to dig a little bit deeper, uh, specifically on escitalopram. So mechanistically, uh, this drug is an SSRI, so selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor. I talked a little bit more about that mechanism in the uh, SSRI section previously, uh, so go check that out in, in general there. Uh, dosing on this medication, um, usual starting dose or the most typical starting dose I see is, is 10 milligrams. Um, in the patient population I work with most, uh, geriatric patients, um, I have seen it started at 5 milligrams. You know, I'm just being cautious and, and conservative. And again, that may depend upon um, what the patient is taking. So if they're on you know, maybe other medications that have, you know, mildly serotonergic activity, you know, maybe they're taking a low dose of tramadol or something, Um, you know, maybe we'd want to be a little bit more conservative in that situation. Another situation um, that might, you know, necessitate more conservative dosing, uh, maybe they've been on other SSRIs in the past and didn't tolerate them for some reason. So they're there are definitely, you know, clinical reasons why we might be more conservative um, versus less conservative. Uh, indications, um, depression, anxiety, uh, certain eating disorders, OCD, lots of different uh, psychiatric indications um, that escitalopram can be used for. Of course, uh, we carry that boxed warning uh, for all SSRIs, the increased risk of uh, suicidal thoughts, you know, particularly associated with uh, younger patients and adults. Uh, adverse effect profile. So this is, I think, you know, as you, you gain more understanding of the class of SSRIs as a whole, there's going to be kind of subtleties uh, between each of these agents. And particularly with escitalopram, um, we think about um, activation versus sedation. So in the scale of of SSRIs, I think about fluoxetine being the most activating typically, uh, while the most sedating SSRI probably tends to be paroxetine. And I would say escitalopram kind of falls right in the middle there of, of maybe being neutral, maybe a tiny bit activating. Again, dose can, can matter and patient response can matter. We can have, um, you know, patients report either activation or sedation. Um, but in general, I'd say it kind of falls in the, the middle range there of uh, sedation and activation. Another thing to, to potentially consider, um, remember escitalopram, is an enantiomer, um, uh, the S enantiomer of citalopram. So you can think that they're probably going to have somewhat similar uh, profiles. And with that, 
uh, QT prolongation is is well reported with citalopram, and it is something that I think about with uh, escitalopram as well. Uh, sexual dysfunction, uh, definitely with all SSRIs, this is something I, I think of. Um, and if I see a, a patient, you know, let's say, taking an erectile dysfunction drug, uh, such as, you know, your uh, sildenafil, for example, or tadalafil, uh, I definitely look and see what other medications they're on. And uh, if they are on an SSRI or other antidepressants that cause sexual dysfunction, um, that's certainly something to look at and assess and think about if we can actually do anything uh, about it. Uh, GI upset, you know, certainly can happen. Um, with the SSRIs in general um, and escitalopram. Um, on the scale of, you know, how significant of, of GI upset or diarrhea does it cause, I would say it's probably in the, the middle range. Again, thinking about our, our other SSRIs, so sertraline probably tends to be the most um, diarrhea-inducing or stomach upset-inducing, uh, whereas... Uh, paroxetine probably tends to be more on the um, constipation side of things due to its anticholinergic effects. So with that said, um, you know, escitalopram would probably fall somewhere in the, the middle there in general. But again, you're going to want to look at the timing of when escitalopram was added, um, potential dose escalations, uh, that may contribute to an increased risk of, of adverse effects as well. Uh, one really important patient education point um, that you need to um, go through with patients is that these drugs take a while to work. I've seen numerous cases in clinical practice where patients maybe encounter some, some mild discomfort, some mild adverse effects, and they stop taking the medication because they don't feel like their depression or whatever we're treating has gotten any better either. So these drugs tend to take weeks of time um, to start providing benefit and to provide uh, that improvement, uh, again, in whatever you're treating, anxiety, depression. It takes a while to work. So very, very important patient education point there. All right, so I'm going to take a quick break now, and we'll finish up with drug interactions. If you're in the market for pharmacist board certification study material, uh, definitely go support our sponsor, meded101.com slash store, S-T-O-R-E. All the resources there help uh, benefit the podcast, help keep it free uh, and educational for all to uh, enjoy and, and benefit from. Uh, we've got uh, common resources books on uh, medication education in general for any you know anyone from a nurse to a nurse practitioner to a you know med student physician, uh, and of course we've got board certification study materials for pharmacists as well. So go check all those resources out at meded101.com/store. Uh, help support the sponsor, which obviously helps support uh, me and this podcast. All right, so let's finish up with drug interactions. So from a uh, metabolism standpoint, uh, when I think of escitalopram, uh, I think of uh, CYP2C19 and CYP3A4. So those... Uh, enzymes do break down escitalopram to a certain extent. Now, would I say it's a, a crazy, crazy extent? No. But would I say that, you know, it can potentially alter the activity and concentrations? Yes, I think there is some uh, significance there. So CYP3A4, you know, we think about, you know, enzyme inducers uh, like rifampin or St. John's wort or uh, carbamazepine those can potentially lower concentrations and drug activity of escitalopram. CYP3A4 inhibitors can obviously do the opposite, potentially uh, increase the risk for elevated uh, concentrations. Uh, CYP2C19, again, another pathway there. Um, classic example is omeprazole. Omeprazole um, potentially has some inhibitory effects on CYP2C19, so concentrations of escitalopram can potentially be elevated a little bit there. 
Of course, um, with that omeprazole interactions and increase in concentrations, uh, we do think of QTC prolongation risk um, with escitalopram, just like we would with citalopram. Uh, I would say there isn't as great uh, of a body of evidence for escitalopram as there is for uh, citalopram, or brand name Selexa. Um, but it is something we, we need to look at. You know, what, it, what does their EKG say to us? Um, are, do they have other risk factors? Are they on other uh, drugs that can interact and uh, raise the risk for QT prolongation? You know, thinking about some of those agents, you know, your amiodarones, your uh, quinolone antibiotics, your antipsychotics, uh, those are all meds that could have additive effects on QT prolongation. Other agents uh, to think about, so if we've got other uh, psych medications on board, you know, TCAs, MAOIs, SNRIs, uh, that's probably not a combination we're ever going to want to use together. Um, with that said, I, I have seen those combinations before, uh, and in general, it's not appropriate. Um, and I would say in, in most situations um, where I've seen, you know, let's say escitalopram on board, you know, with a TCA, you know, often we're transitioning or trying to transition off of one uh, to another for whatever, you know, the, the purpose may be, whether that's, you know, neuropathic pain or fibromyalgia or, or whatever the, the case may be or the indication. Uh, so that's important to think about, that that additive uh, serotonergic load and, you know, of course, risk of, of serotonin syndrome. A uh, couple of others that may come up as far as drug interactions go, uh, hyponatremia. So all SSRIs can do this. So think about some of your diuretics, you know, thiazides, things like that, uh, oxcarbazepine, carbamazepine. These are all drugs that can contribute to SIADH and, and hyponatremia, and we could potentially have additive effects when we start to add on more and more medications that can do this. And then one last thing that, that does come up occasionally is bleed risk. Um, I, I, I don't think it's a huge issue for most patients. However, if you've got patients on, you know, anticoagulants, antiplatelet medications, you know, your, your heparins, your uh, DOAC, such as apixaban, rivaroxaban, um, there is a potential that SSRIs and, and escitalopram specifically here could slightly raise that risk for bleeding. So when I see patients on both, and it it happens in clinical practice quite a bit where patients are on a drug like escitalopram, you know, with aspirin or, you know, with an anticoagulant. Um, I assess that patient for uh, bleed risk. You know, are they anemic? Uh, do they have bruising? Have they reported bleeding in the past? And from that, we've got to weigh that risk versus benefit of, you know, how beneficial has escitalopram been? And, you know, what other potential medications is this patient taking that may increase their risk of, of bleed as well? So, again, it's not an absolute, you know, contraindication where, you know, we can't use escitalopram in a patient um, that's taking a, a medication that increases the risk of bleed. But it is something that I, I take a peek at and at least look. And if they've got a substantial, substantial bleed history, um, I'm definitely going to you know, look at that and, and, you know, at least start to uh, assess what is the risk versus benefit of um, looking at the SSRI as well as looking at the uh, other medications that may induce that bleed risk as well. So I think that's going to wrap it up for today. Uh, thank you so much for listening. If you've uh, found this podcast beneficial, uh, leave us a rating review on iTunes or wherever you're listening. Uh, also take the time to uh, support the sponsor, meded101.com slash store. Take advantage of the free uh, audiobook that Audible gives you if you've never done that before. Again, you can find links to that uh, at meded101.com slash store, S-T-O-R-E. If you want to track me down, suggestions, comments, 
um, definitely reach out to me at mededucation101 at gmail.com or you can find me on LinkedIn as well. And of course, head to reallifepharmacology.com, sign up, snag your uh, free 31-page PDF on the top 200 drugs. All right, well, I thank you so much for listening. Uh, Take care, have a great rest of your day.